having a having a very no, interesting conversation. Take, <laughs> I know you will. That's fine. So we'll <laughs> We're having a you'll need to put those on. Right. conversation off air. He, he's been here before. <laughs> <laughs> a few times. Uh, we were joined in the studio by State Representative Stephen Harkin, formerly. I guess the, the the honorific still stays, right? I mean, you're still all Just representative. Retired. <laughs> the I remember an interview I did many many years ago with uh, George Allen, and uh, he had he had been governor of Virginia, he'd been a senator, he'd been a member of the House. I said, so which one do you get called now that you're out of office? And he said, governor, because that's the highest office I had. And so, but that stays with you, uh, just like we call Joe Biden vice president. And of course, we're joined by uh, Steve Millington too. Steve sticking around. Uh, Steve's the chairman of the Twin Falls County Republican Party Committee. Actually, you've served a few years there with Mr. Hartkin uh, in in yeah. in that particular uh, role. And uh, when, when he was, you have a microphone there, you know. <laughs> when he was in the legislature, I was county chairman, and we had some. Very strong conversations occasionally about <laughs> He's my never opinion had a strong and his conversation, opinion. Right? But <laughs> we wanted to point out we're talking about a new book uh, that the representative has written. And of course, before his decade in the state legislature, Tradition and Progress. And, uh, and then the subtitle is Southern Idaho's Growth Since 1990. So it's a three decade look at what's transpired here. And of course, we want to point out you have some writing experience from your time in the newspaper business, which you were in for decades as well. Uh, including, you know, wrapping up as publisher at the Times News. That's right. So now that you've got a little more time, you decided to sit down and do some writing. Uh, the changes we've seen, there's going to be some, what I would say, certain things look probably exactly almost as they did in 1990, but we've had some very dramatic change as well. It's not just population growth. It has indeed changed a lot, but in many ways, uh, and that's really the subject of the book, we've retained our cultural values and we've incorporated those into the growth as kind of a background to the growth. It's really a book about the cultural values of Southern Idaho, faith, conservative uh, roots, uh, egalitarian uh, politics and common sense, uh, not particularly ideological politics, uh, religion and faith, uh, as well as things like uh, minorities and how the minority population has impacted our our growth and our changes. And then I look at some specifics like media, and I talk a little bit about uh, education and environment and energy. And then I kind of wind up with a chapter on uh, what are we saying about ourselves in local history? How do we write about ourselves and how will we per be perceived as, as, uh, as an area in the future? I have a background in American history. I have a doctorate in American history from the University of Minnesota years ago. And I, in my earlier life, I was a college professor teaching journalism and history. And so I've sort of returned to that after retiring from the legislature. And I love writing about uh, local affairs and local issues. I have a column in the paper and also on uh, Idaho Politics Weekly. And I'm working on yet another book. So it's a, it's a busy time for me. I just turned 75 and I feel about 40. So I'm about right. Yeah, you had a birthday on Sunday. I did. Yeah. So, my yesterday was Monday, actually. Okay. Well, okay. <clears throat> well, I, I read the... Uh... Uh, op-ed piece in Idaho Politics Weekly, and you were talking about, you know, 75 years old, and I've been walking on this earth for about 74 out of those 75 years. That's right. The first year I was kind of a squiggly, squirmy little guy. <laughs> uh, I didn't walk too much until later. But my mom says I was the cutest baby ever. So, <laughs> uh, You know, we got about a minute before the first break, but when you used to come on the program while you were still serving in Boise and you would reference being a common sense conservative. It took me for a while to pick up on the meaning of that. And that, I think, tell me if I'm right here. The meaning is that you have to have a conservatism that says, what can we get to, what is possible? Because there are certain ideologies we have, but they aren't necessarily possible when you get 105 people who have to come to an agreement on something. That's exactly right, Bill. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad to see you've come around to Mama's way of thinking. <laughs> I didn't say uh, I agree, but I understand it. It's, uh, it's, uh, it is a common sense conservative state. It's uh, not particularly ideological. It's really oriented towards practical solutions. If you go out and sit at the Curry Cafe for breakfast and you hear guys talking about politics, and then the first guy to get up and leave will say, well, you guys go ahead. I got to set the water or I got to take in the yeah. cows or I got to, I got to thrash this field this morning, but you guys go ahead. You know, you guys keep talking about politics. So we're not particularly ideological as we have in North Idaho. 
And I think that's really, from my perspective, we're, we're less polarized here and more, uh, more integrated as a community. We have less of the, of the polarization that you see in other parts of the United States over things like politics and race and sociology and faith and all kinds of things. Here we're pretty common sense oriented, let people live, accept each other, work hard, uh, conservative, uh, hardworking values. It's a great place to live. It's a wonderful valley. Uh, I've, I've been here almost 40 years and uh, I expect to spend the rest of my life here. Hopefully that'll be a bunch more. So we want, We've got to take a short break. We've got more coming up with State Representative, formerly Stephen Hartkin. Uh, you know, it's difficult to get out of, you've got to add that formally in there. Yeah, you uh, should add, yeah. yeah. <laughs> my wife will get kind of... Yeah. <laughs> there wait, is a representative heart can Wait still. a minute. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a short break ahead. Steve Millington joining us as well, too. Bill Colley on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. We have a guest joining us who's just finished, uh, completed a book, and it is available uh, for your purchase. If, uh, if you've got an interest in just the changing nature of uh, the Magic Valley, in many ways it doesn't change, though, we should point out, too, as well. We're at 35 coming up on 843 on Magic Valley this morning on News Radio 1310, uh, KLIX, and News Radio 1310.com. And former State Representative Stephen Hartkin has written this book, and he was also formerly editor and publisher at the Times News. Uh, Steve Millington joining us in the studio, too, as well, and Bill Colley handling the phones. Uh, that number, 208-736-0300. So if people want copies, there's a number of ways they can go about doing this. They can get it at uh, Barnes. And they can get it at uh, the visitor center, or at the hospital gift shop this fall, uh, or they can order it directly online from Amazon, uh, just under my name, Stephen Hartkin, and it'll pull them up. Uh, or they can go to the publisher directly, Rydenbaugh Press. And the and, and Rydenbaugh uh, obviously publishes a lot of Idaho-based books. They do. They're a very good publisher. Uh, Randy Staples, who has a column in the paper, is a publisher of that publishing house. And they specialize in Western uh, Western Americana, and they do a lot of things on sociology and cultural values and history and so forth. They're, they've told the Idaho story in lots of ways, and they're very good to work with. So you're a media watcher because of your background, and uh, and and since you live in town, you hear some of this program, and uh, you have an interesting t- <laughs> you have an interesting take on Magic Valley this morning. Well, I do, and I'll and I'll actually I'll quote from the book. Uh, <laughs> I want to, you know, when I have a section in the media chapter and I talk about clicks and, uh, and, and Bill here, and I talk about how Bill's show is very, very well listened to and it's uh, kind of the go-to place. But I said it does have kind of a, the show has what I call a, and I'm quoting here, an outer space flavor of alt-right, <laughs> uh, alt-right uh, guests and, uh, and followers, okay? And I say these are mostly anti-UN types. Uh, people who are, you know, beating up on the Democrats, and uh, and occasionally a legislator, most of whom don't uh, come from this area at all, but they sort of represent that more conservative perspective. Uh, and I said, uh, so this is a, a, a uh, hold on a second, you got my page. I said, I said uh, the show has uh, various conspiracy theories, anti-UN rants, and anti-Democrat ramblings, and anti-Rhino uh, on most issues. Uh, and I say that that's uh, you know that adds to the liveliness of the discussions. How does that compare to if you look back on the history of radio, uh, just radio shows in this area? Because there aren't many. You've got Zeb doing a radio program from his house just down the road. You've got I'm the only other really local person, and then you've got a handful of other shows around the state. Three in Boise that are local. Uh, you've got one show that's on two cities in East Idaho, and then I think there's a, a small player up in Sand Point. Um, but how does it compare to what you hear in other parts of the state? Well, I think it's it is comparable in some regards. You know, I, Twin Falls has a long history in radio of having talk radio. Uh, the original owners uh, back in the '70s, uh, when they bought the station, we had one of the first early talk radio shows in the country with L. James Kudnick. And I know many of our really older senior right. senior listeners will remember L. James. And he was kind of like uh, he was kind of like you, Bill. Only he was uh, even more irascible on, from time to time, if you can if you can believe that. Okay. And then that was followed by a couple of other people, and then they tried a double pairing with Kelly uh, Class and Jill Scheme, with Kelly taking the more conservative view, and and Jill kind of representing the more liberal or democratic perspective. Uh, and so we've had a long history in the Magic Valley of uh, you know of commentary and talk radio. I think it's been a real plus 
for the area. It's given people an opportunity to kind of keep up with the issues. You guys are very well informed. Uh, you read a lot. You talk uh, well about the subjects, both national and local. And it does give an airing uh, to uh, to uh, what I might call some a little bit of outer space perspective, as I say in the in the book. But I think that's uh, that's not a criticism, really. It's just a, it's just the way I think the, the shows work. I think know? that on a continuum, I look around the state, and you know, I listen to Neil Larson when I'm in that part of the state, and and Neil is a calmer presence on the air, uh, and the woman who does news with him is very very good, and but they they have a more cerebral I think approach to what they do. Uh, and then I think that Kevin Miller and Zeb Bell probably may, may be even a little bit more to the right than I am. Uh, and then the, the guys at the other station, which is owned by Cumulus, heavily in debt. Uh, now, who uh, are those other guys? <laughs> they're they're up in uh, Boise, but they you know they they have a good local afternoon talk show. The morning show is more of a traditional morning radio program. Uh, and, and and you know, Nate in the afternoon, I believe that's who, who's on the air uh, at, at KBOI. I think that he probably comes across. He, he, I don't know how to categorize him. I wouldn't put him, though, in any of those other categories. But if, if, if you are listening to radio as an alternative to other media in the state of Idaho, even on the right of center on the dial, you have a lot of different variety. There is a lot of choice out there. Uh, you mentioned Zeb Bell, and Zeb's been a fixture in this area for decades and has overcome you know, some significant personal physical issues. He had polio as a youngster, but he keeps on... Keeps on chugging on, chugging on, and uh, you know he has a, a good following, particularly in the rodeo and and uh, ag sector group. When you talk about the culture, we haven't necessarily become more. In some ways, I guess it is more cosmopolitan than it would have been 30 years ago. But it's almost as if that's been they absorb this culture once they come here. I think that's exactly right. That you know the, one of the political divisions is that people on the left seem to think that Idaho will become more liberal as more Californians move in is kind of a common view. But actually that's not the case. As uh, as people move in, they tend to be people who are leaving the place there were for the reasons that they want to come here as a positive uh, attraction. The clean quality of life, low crime, ease of transportation if you have a car, uh, generally a conservative uh, environment, and something in the cultural air. Our cultural air is a conservative, family-oriented, individualistic, uh, common endeavor, egalitarian, cultural air. And that, in turn, I think, attracts people from who are trying to escape something that's usually not the same way in California or the West Coast. Most of our move-ins are from either Oregon, Washington, California, and quite a bit from Utah. Those are the four primary uh, places that people who move here come from. But once they get here, they they, they sort of are attracted by what they see and then they become part of what's already here. They typically do not go off on, on tangents. We don't have a, a virulent uh, lefty party in Twin Falls. Uh, and we have some people who come from a more conservative perspective, but they don't generally occupy the political or the social center either of the, of the discussion in the community. If you look at our central committee, uh, and Steve's been chairman of that for a number of years, it's a good place to kind of see that. The people who come into the Central Committee as precinct people tend to be maybe a little more ideological at first, and then they really get involved in solving problems. They may not participate quite as much in the fairs and the parades and so forth. And Steve's always beaten up on us to do more, uh, to do more of that. Uh, but the, the politics of the group is relatively, relatively uh, common sense oriented, uh, not really establishment. Uh, we have a strong strain of anti-federalism. We're surrounded by millions of acres of public land. You're never going to take our guns. I mean, uh, that's a that's a that's a line in the sand issue for people in this exactly. valley. Uh, so if you look at the various issues, uh, we're common sense oriented, but quite conservative. It's kind of like you know, if you drive into the valley over the the hill from Jackpot, and all of a sudden there's this verdant valley that stretches out in both directions, and you can see the mountains 80 or 100 miles away in the distance. And you say, if you're from a more urban area, and you say, how did I not know about this place? And it strikes you as it's, it's isolated, and it's homogeneous, and it's very common sense oriented, and it, feels, it just feels like an America that used to be, in a way. You know, and we don't have a lot of 
Democrats representing us in the state legislatures. So the closest I get to talk to anybody, um, you know, I get to talk to Matt Erpelding and Melissa Wintrow and some of the others. But I, I genuinely like them. I don't find them to be, I don't agree with them on a lot of issues, but I don't find them to be personality-wise extremists, which I think is another thing you could say about the other party in Idaho. I think that's right, that they're, they try to edge up close to the, to the Republicans because that's the only way they can sound like they're even marginally electable. Uh, we have in this county a small, uh, relatively uh, common-sense-oriented group of Democrats uh, but really, the only Democratic contingency in the Valley is in Blaine County, which is really kind of a separate island of rich homes and nice restaurants and, and more liberal politics. Uh, and that's in some ways separate from the Magic Valley. I talk about the politics of both areas in, in my uh, book. The conservatism in the Magic Valley has given the Republican Party uh, a what I would call a consistent leg up going back actually to the very first elections that this county voted Republican. And it occasionally would veer off in during like the Great Depression and during the bull moose period under Teddy, Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, but other than that, it's been consistently Republican. It's usually about 60 to 65, occasionally 68 percent in any given election. And the Democrats hold typically 30 to 35 percent of the, of the voting strength and the rest is then spread among constitutionalists and whatever. Brad Little, in the last election, he carried every single precinct in the Magic Valley except two. There were only two precincts that he did not carry, and those were both in Twin Falls, on the south side of Twin Falls, and he almost, he would, and he didn't lose those by much. They were very competitive. He only lost by eight or ten votes in those two precincts, but he carried every single precinct elsewhere from the Magic Valley, from Glens Ferry to Cassia County. Every single precinct went for Brad Little, okay? So that's a good indicator of where the common sense uh, orientation of the voters uh, lies. And that's the way we want it to be. We want everybody in the whole valley voting Republican. <laughs> <laughs> I have a kind of a, you know, a strong point of view on that. You, you mentioned, we haven't got there. I don't know how much time we have. We've got about five minutes before the break. You, you mentioned that, that there's some... Uh, uh, geographical differences between the Magic Valley, the area we're involved with here, and some other sections of the state of Idaho, perhaps most notably North Idaho Republicans. And they seem to be uh, just a little bit more uh, apart from our brand of Republicanism. I think that's right, and I think you can identify the reasons. North Idaho is a land of, of mountains and lakes and forests. And big landowners, the federal government, the mining companies, the timber companies, it has a long history of, uh, of labor unrest through the, both the mining and the timber industries. It has higher unionization, and it has, relatively speaking, less agriculture. Okay? And so people who live in North Idaho tend to pick up the culture there, which is more individualistic, uh, uh, how shall I say, more in-your-face uh, anti-government. And so those kinds of views, particularly in the smaller towns of, uh, of North and Central Idaho, tend to be more prevalent. In Southern Idaho, the way it was settled, it was settled by both two strains mostly, mostly from the Mormon church coming up from Utah, Mormon farmers, and then agricultural people from the Midwest uh, who were, you know, saw a better opportunity in land. They were attracted by the low price of land, which was only 25 cents an acre at that time, okay? And so they came out here and they proved up, and they brought their values and their common sense orientations with them. They were already Republicans in most of those situations. So they brought their common sense Republicanism with them. The very first elections held in Twin Falls County went two and a half to one Republican, just like it would today typically. And there have been some dips again occasionally in times of stress like the Great Depression. But for the most part, the values that are shared by the people here, both Mormon and non-Mormon, tend to be the same common values, an appreciation of family, appreciation of faith, appreciation of conservative approach to financing, physical discipline, prudence in life. It's almost like we live in a world in which you know, common work and common labor and common endeavor are the things that bind us to each other, uh, what Lincoln used to call the, the mystic cords of memory. And so you see that a lot in our different institutions in our community. That's the topic of my next book, is how 
how those institutions transfer and transmit values across generations again and again and again from one from one generation to the next. And here we are, we're really only four or five generations removed from being settled. Uh, I was talking with a lady at the book signing the other day whose uh, grandfather came here in 1915 and, and, and uh, proved up a piece of land. So those kinds of things are still very evident in our community and they're passed down through the families, through our values and through our institutions, church, fairs, politics, social clubs, you name it. You can find different ways in which those, uh, those uh, connections are, I want to say, glued together as a social glue. And uh, it's, to me, it's a fascinating topic of cultural assimilation and, and how that's integrated into our lives as, as Americans and as Southern Idahoans. When we get to the break, uh, we got to break. Uh, the former representative, Stephen Hartkin, is in the studio with us. He's going to be here until 9.30, and we're at 38 right now. Steve Ellington joining us as well. It's 8.57. Bill Colley on News Radio 1310, KLIX, and News 1310.com. But after the break, you hit on something. A couple of years ago, I read a piece in a travel magazine about Ogden, and the writer was saying that Ogden, which is a lot like Twin Falls, if you really think about it, uh, the, the whole northern part of Utah is very much, you really driving, if you didn't see a, a sign telling you, you probably wouldn't notice much of a difference. But the writer said that Ogden, if you're looking for 1950s values, is one of those places where it still exists in the United States. And following the break, maybe we can talk a little bit about that because we're so much culturally similar to that. And yes, there are bigger buildings and changes and more traffic and the like, but certain aspects of life here I don't think ever really change. And so uh, if we can address that perhaps in the next half hour. I'd be glad to. That sounds good. And just quickly again... Uh, we'll get back to details on where you can find the book in the next half hour as well. But first, we have a check of the news on News Radio 1310, KLIX, and NewsRadio1310.com. Former State Representative uh, Stephen Hartkin joining us in the studio this morning, and he has just uh, completed a book on some of the changes and, and the things that have stayed the same again, tradition and progress, Southern Idaho's growth since 1990. You see, yesterday morning when I was mentioning it, I had it right here with me because you were on the front page of the newspaper that you used to run. Uh, and uh, and so, although I used to have a, a boss who would tell me, it was an editor I worked for, who said, no, we don't run things. That He told me that was a poor choice of words. Uh, I've been browbeat by those people all of my life, and uh, uh, it, you know, after a while you, you get really sensitive about what language you're using while you're talking. Uh, but we've also got Steve Millington joining us, Bill Colley, too, on Magic Valley this morning on News Radio 1310, KLIX, and News Radio 1310.com. So where do, where do people get a copy? Well, we can get a copy at uh, at the visitor center by the bridge. I'll also have copies at the hospital gift shop later this fall, and you can get it on Amazon uh, directly. Just go to books, and then Stephen Hartkin, and it's right there. Uh, or you can get it directly from the publisher, Rydenbaugh Press, and you can go to their website, and it's on their website as well. We we're talking just before the break uh, about how, in many ways, the culture here is about the same as it was probably fifty or sixty years ago. And some people are really, and I mentioned a travel writer who was in Ogden, but it's very close, and he was he was just gushing about how wonderful that is, uh, that you don't you don't you don't deal with a lot of the other problems that the rest of the world seems to be facing. Well, I think that's right in a certain sense. It's not to say that we haven't changed, but we've learned to what I would call sort of accum- accumulate or a, 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 a take in or attract uh, change, and at the same time hold on to our cultural values particularly as it relates to faith and land ownership patterns and conservative nature and conservative common sense approach to social issues and so forth. Is there a danger that that could change over time? Is there a tipping point? Perhaps. There are many examples in American history and where small towns have become sizable towns and then bigger cities. And somewhere along that process, the culture changes. Uh, In Idaho's case, uh, that hasn't happened so much in southern Idaho one, because of our isolation, and two, because of our uh, relative homogeneity of population. Now, we have pressures on both those fronts. It's easier to get here than it used to be. Uh, it's also a more diverse population with the growth of Hispanic population and refugees and so forth. But for the most part, we've retained those cultural values. And if you go out, for example, out to one of our new processing plants and you look at the workforce, 
the workforce is maybe more diverse than what you're used to seeing just around town. But they're after the same thing that we were after, the American dream. They want to rise up and do better and have their kids uh, have the opportunities that maybe their grandparents and great-grandparents didn't have. For example, over in Jerome County, uh, there's a whole number of sections of town where Hispanic families are buying homes and, and, and being, becoming essentially permanent, permanent residents of that, of that valley, even they, though they may have had, uh, how should we say, I- illegal uh, alien uh, ancestors. Okay, that's pretty common. Well, you know, when, when we talk a little bit about this, and you mentioned that tipping point, it, it, you know, there's really, I guess, no figure. Would it be 60,000, 70,000? But there was a guy writing in, in The Statesman a couple of weeks ago who was talking about his journey out west, and he came from a large city, and he's a professional, does some writing himself, and he joked, he said, now that it's gotten too crowded here, I guess we all go to Twin Falls next. Uh, well, that's certainly a <laughs> spillover possibility uh, when you go down the road 100 miles. You know, but I, when I go to give talks in Boise, and I do that occasionally, uh, I very often will talk out, well, now, you know, I know a lot of you people have never actually driven up past Micron on the interstate. And, uh, you know, and all of a sudden you, have, you ask yourself, am I going to need food and water? Is it uh, just a bunch of farms and Republicans and sort of old dinosaurs uh, still roaming the landscape? And in a sense, it is. In a sense, it's a cultural, there's a cultural veil, as it were, somewhere between uh, the Micron plant and Mountain Home and maybe even more so as you get to Glens Ferry. And you realize that you are not in the same place as Boise, that you are in a place with a different cultural feel, the farming community, the agriculture, the ranching. Uh, all those things sort of uh, lead to you to think, how did how is this place different? How is it different from what I'm used to? And I think that's part of the appeal and, and what I'm trying to capture in this book and hopefully in the next one is how those values are, are how they are in the cultural air and how they're transmitted uh, across generations. So are we are, do we run the risk of seeing some of those cultural values uh, diminish as, as these people in-migrate into the Magic Valley? Well, certainly everybody who comes from the outside uh, brings their own perspective from outside perspectives. And we've had several changes in the Magic Valley which have brought some change. For example, the development of the medical center here has brought in and attracted medical professionals from various med schools who ordinarily would not consider southern Idaho. Uh, Their spouses want to live a little closer to a bigger city. They want a conservative environment to raise their kids. But previously, previously, uh, Twin Falls didn't have the option for that with the older hospital. But now with the new hospital, which is one of the best regional hospitals in the United States, this becomes an attractive magnet for medical professionals, which are then spreading out into various communities. They get active in their families, in their churches, and so forth. The same thing has happened with our development of the arts. Our arts council and our arts accumulation around uh, CSI particularly and now with some beginnings of public art in the in the in the community, again that creates a, an environment in which some arts professionals who ordinarily wouldn't have considered a place like Twin Falls see it as more attractive. Uh, the college and uh, and the and the uh, hospital and the Mormon Temple is another uh, entity that helps create that kind of diversity. Until the temple was built in 2008. Mormons here had to go to Logan or over to Boise in order to participate in their temple ceremonies. But the local uh, stakes here asked for and received uh, a temple. The population reached a point where Salt Lake basically agreed that it was ready to build a temple in Twin Falls. And that in turn has created a given sort of what I would call a religious and social anchor to the community. It's not just a visible church as you drive into town. It's also a social anchor for that particular uh, congregation, and that in turn creates, again, the stability of change. And a lot of those folks are coming from areas uh, that ordinarily they would uh, have gone to a place where that was more readily available, Boise, Salt Lake, Logan, uh, and so forth. So, yes, we are, in a sense, coming of age, okay? And I really see the 1990 to the new period as sort of that point where the old uh, Intermountain uh, state sort of slips away, the old ranching state, and we become the beginnings of an Intermountain modern state with the many of the amenities that we expect 
Do we have them all? No, you still have to go to attend professional sports. Uh, Boise State's a pretty good substitute if you like football. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, it's a very good substitute if you like football. Uh, but we don't have any pro teams. And high school sports here is relatively modest. Uh, there's very few kids actually go on to large four-year programs. Uh, the College of Southern Idaho brings in people from all over the western United States and occasionally from overseas, and that again provides some cultural diversity in the community uh, and adds to the, the what I call the sort of the, the, the cultural mix. I, I think a, a little bit about what you were just talking about. I, I was telling you off air, I, got, I was interviewed by a trade magazine when I first took this job about what's different here than where I'd worked before, and I said, well, they have high school rodeo teams here which you do not find in many other parts of the country. Oh, uh, high school rodeo, I think, is just a solid example of, of, a, of a cultural entity that's different from what you would find elsewhere. Just like you find in northern Minnesota, you're going to find high school hockey teams. Well, we don't have enough ice long enough in the year <laughs> to have a hockey team, okay? So we're restricted to either football, basketball, or track, or a little baseball, okay? So the sports, in a way, sort of reflects the diversity of the area, but also the, you know, the physical nature of the area. All history, and I write this in the book, all history begins with geography. And our geography, our canyon, our arid landscape, our crops, rotational cycles, those are the things that sort of the constants and the undercurrents that are here, the climate, the weather, fire, water. And I write about those early in the book, but then I move uh, to talk about the cultural values and how those are connected to the underlying currents. I read a book by uh, Robert Kagan a few years ago um, called Earning the Rockies, and it was based on how that geography shapes things. And and you think about Russia as the way it is because it, it the, it's the cold and the geography, and you know Hawaii is the way it is because it's that, that, that the beautiful climate. But first of all, you have this great big gash going down through the valley, uh, in the canyon, and you've got, it was a high desert. Geog- the, the culture built around that. I, that's exactly right. And, you know, the first, we don't realize how difficult life was here at the first settlement period. It was very rapidly settled. The area went from virtually zero to about 65,000 people within the first 10, 15 years, okay? And they were spread out in mostly single-family farms. Uh, typically, they were 80s to 120 to 160 acres, uh, they they owned the land at 25 cents an acre. They, the real money they had to pay was to the water shares, okay? But they hunted the land itself. And so the land, they gave them a place to live. And they built these little tiny uh, prove-up shacks. Typically, they're no more than two or 300 square feet. You can see a lot of them are still around today. They're out in the back of farmsteads, usually used today as kind of a tool shed or storage or whatever. But those were where people lived until they could afford to build a real home off the value of the crops that were created that they were able to plant and then sell. Uh, that's what gave the valley its value. We didn't have any real rich here. There was no old money. It was Everybody was kind of egalitarian. We had women's suffrage right from the start. We had women's rights right from the start. They could own land. In fact, there were quite a few single women who came out here as single women and proved up the title to land. Okay, single women. I interviewed a lady uh, the other day who told me that her great great aunt came out here from uh, Nebraska and Colorado, and then was followed by her grandfather. But the great aunt owned the owned a section, a, a piece of a section, and farmed it. Well, that attracted, of course, a lot of single men who looked down the road and saw Sally working the farm. And so, there, as one early source says, it kind of created a, an uptick in marriages, as one would expect. Okay. <laughs> And so people became more acculturated to that. The small farms, the relatively small uh, schoolhouses, the relatively small, easily accessible towns. Remember, this was in the pre-industrial period. And in the first census, there were 6,000 cows in Twin Falls County. I'm sorry, 6,000 horses in Twin Falls County and three jackasses. Now, that number's clearly changed. Okay. <laughs> But there was, sure. the number of horses was greater. There was almost no tractors at first, okay? We were we were settled before the era of tractors. And so the horse-drawn plow was the common way to which you broke the land. We're going to take a short break. We've got more coming up. Former State Representative Steve Hartkin. Stephen Hartkin, we, we were debating earlier, which one do you like to go by? Either way. Uh, we've got more coming up in just a few minutes. 
on uh, News Radio 1310, KLIX, and News Radio 1310.com. Steve Millington still with us, too, as well. And Bill Colley on Magic Valley this morning. It's 38. Having a discussion today with a former state representative, Stephen Hartkin, uh, joining us in the studio, talking about the new book that he has written. It's 38. We're at 922. Steve Millington with us as well. And again, the title is Tradition and Progress, subtitle Southern Idaho's Growth Since 1990. So it covers three decades, really, an entire generation uh, of time. And, uh, Bill Colley with you on Magic Valley this morning until uh, 10 o'clock, and we're at 38. Steve Millington just brought up a wonderful uh, thought in the in the break. Okay, so we're looking at 30 years now. What happens over the next 30 years? What's the crystal ball that you have, say? Well, the future is always to some extent unknown, and and the present is what we're living in today. But the past is always with us, okay? Uh, Faulkner has a wonderful comment where he says, William Faulkner, he says, the past is never dead. It isn't even past. And it's a very insightful remark because we carry forward with us into the future and through our present, we carry those both direct memory and community memory of what we were. And one of the beautiful things about this valley uh, is not just its, uh, its beauty and physical beauty, but it's the cultural beauty of the valley that we carry those, those, those messages, so to speak, in the community to the community institutions that we have, and those I think provide glue and what we might call anchor uh, to whatever changes are coming. Are there going to be changes? Certainly, we're going to have a third bridge. We'll have we'll probably have a bypass around the south side of Twin Falls. Maybe not right through the front doorstep of Clicks, but uh, a little further out. Uh, well, you know, the, the canyon is a barrier, but it's also a, a crossable barrier. So we will have some of that. Uh, in terms of social institutions, we're likely to have some changes. Will it be will it be turned into another Boise North End uh, or Blaine County? I, I don't think so. Uh, I think that our roots are basically, they're not fixed, but they're established so strongly that it's very hard for extremist views to take root either on the right or on the left. And so most common sense folks, as you'd find out here at the Curry Cafe having coffee this morning, or down at Idaho Joe's, uh, they're going to have the same views, and their children and grandchildren are likely to have the same views. The really interesting thing to me is what brings people back. And in my new book I'm writing about, about that process, I'm talking with younger people who've returned here when they were graduating from high school, they couldn't help but to get away. And, you know, is there a military recruiter who hasn't heard, gee, I got, I just got to see the world. I got to get out of here. And But then you know, as they get older, they appreciate more the cultural values of what the area had. And Twin Falls and the Magic Valley becomes almost a haze in their memory, a pleasant haze. And it's that place and remembrance uh, which, which pulls them, sort of pulls them home, so to speak. <clears throat> okay, we we want these kids to have fond remembrances of of their growing up years, and and in addition to that, we got to have some reason for them to return back here, and and uh, one of the things that always concerns me is, are we doing enough to provide jobs for these people to to come back to their home, to their roots? Well, I think, and, and what kind of jobs do we want? I think that's a good question. You know, uh, the you know every community has an economic geography, and if you think of the economic geography of the <coughs> of the Magic Valley, it's it's based on the agriculture, the relatively free cost, lower cost of land, quality of life of higher water, good labor force, but not particularly not particularly well educated labor force, and so. The companies that have come here in the last 20 years, like a Chobani and a Cliff Bar and expansions like uh, Glambia, which has been here for many years before, uh, they are basically taking advantage of the combination of those pieces of economic geography. Now, any one of those can change, and we know that from our life experience. A, a closed mill in Ohio, an abandoned mine in Minnesota, uh, a, a pulp mill in Maine that uh, has shut down. That if any one of those major pieces of economic geography changes, either labor or, or cost of shipping or transportation or availability of whatever the product is, then the apple cart can be upset. 
But it's always better, it seems to me, to focus on the job creation rather than on the individual recruitment. Individual recruitment, it's, it's a one, one person, one, one at a time, and they're going to make that decision as mostly a reflection of their life experience. And it takes a lot to, to make them change. You know, when times are better, which they are in the America today, people are less likely to move from where they were to where somewhere else. When times are tough, like the Oki days and so forth, they were willing to pick up and move to a place like Idaho for a fresh start because it couldn't be any worse than it was in windblown dust field, you know, Oklahoma and whatever. Here, with times are being pretty good, it's hard to get people to move either in or out. I saw a recent study that said that you would have to have a 50% differential in wages for most people to even consider picking up and moving to another community, much less, uh, and it has to be at least 50% more than what they're currently making. They won't even look at it because the family ties that they have here and the community ties are so strong intuitively that they won't give those up and go, you know, and cast their ship out on a new sea without some real reason to do so. That's interesting that if they have if they've had an experience in a Magic Valley a root an upbringing here, it's a good chance they may come back. Excellent. But we but we may not get the a segment of population who has no previous background with Magic well, Valley. Well, you're, you're not going to get you know a kid from uh, California who's grown up in an urban area. Or the guy not... from the guy from upstate New York. Yes. Uh, but you know, but if the person has a what I would say, sort of a personal inner inner heart that connects with rural America, they will look at an area like this with a great deal of positive view because this represents in their mind not just the landscape but the social landscape in which they were raised. We all carry the familiarity of our youth with us, and if it's a positive experience, we tend to try to replicate it later again and again and again in our lives. My next book, the working title, is called Place and Remembrance, and it kind of reflects the importance of those things in, in people's uh, lives. We have a break coming up uh, with, Todd Star- mm, excuse me, with Todd Starnes along. The cold weather is leaving us all a little bit hoarse today. Um, more, though, with former state representative Stephen Hartkin. He's going to spend a few more minutes with us. Steve Millington in the studio as well. Bill Colley on News Radio 1310, KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. It's 38 at 9.30. We wanted to mention that we're going to spend a few more minutes with former state representative Stephen Hartkin and uh, kind of getting some views about the changes in the Magic Valley and uh, directions, too, that we may be going. Uh, and Steve Millington joining us, too. Bill Colley as well on News Radio 1310, KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. We're at 39. Uh, you were talking about the book again, and the book uh, the title is Tradition and Progress Southern Idaho's Growth Since 1990. I will memorize this eventually. Um, <laughs> just. <laughs> By rote. <laughs> yeah, we've been doing it long enough this morning. Uh, we, we were just talking. You have a chapter in the book about uh, media in the area. And uh, the thing is, is that you you saw this coming, too, when you were working at the newspaper. And I've seen it over the last, well, since the 1996 Telecom Act, uh, which was supposedly going to be the be-all, end-all for broadcasters. It wasn't. The, the, the retrenchment of local media. Uh, there are only 18 people working in this building, and that's in all departments with four radio stations. Uh, KMVT is working with a much smaller staff. The newspaper is, has had to make some some cuts uh, according to budget. So we're going to have a future where those guys sitting around uh, having breakfast at Curry Crossing or anywhere else in the Valley, what are they going to rely on for information? Because there's just not as much of it on the local level, I, I suppose, as there once was. Well, I think the aggregation of American media into uh, aggregated sites like, uh, you know, Real Politics and... Uh, and MSNBC and so forth has changed the nature, certainly, of the the local media landscape. But actually, our local media landscape is, in some ways, much more open than it used to be. You know, 30 years ago, you had the Times News, this radio station, uh, a local television station. That's pretty much it. Now you have a whole range of cable and Internet services available, either direct stream or or, or however you're going to receive them. And so the average person follows uh, the national and, to some degree, the international news from that perspective. What's dropped, of course, is that the support for local news gathering, which is labor-intensive, has created a a, a sort of a a black hole in which local media properties, particularly on the print side, have had difficulty uh, changing and managing. 
the print industry across America has not yet figured out how to digitalize and monetize the digital uh, mainstream uh, media, internet, and so forth. So I think we'll see, but I think we also see some 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 signs of change. For example, a new paper starts up in Jerome uh, mm-hmm. that's locally oriented once a month. Okay, the weekly paper down in Hawaii uh, County, down in Ava- in in uh, Homedale, the Hawaii Avalanche does an excellent job of covering the community of Hawaii County, and you see that in certain other locations where things are they're a little more isolated. But if the paper is sort of, you know, within the shadow of a bigger area, like in the Boise shadow, it tends to be more difficult. I noticed, for example, that in the Boise market, the Idaho Press Tribune, which is printed in Nampa and used to call itself the Nampa Press Tribune, has now become the paper of the Treasure Valley. And they're taking on Boise right in their home turf, and the Boise building is still for sale. The the Statesman building there on Curtis Road is, is once again up for sale because they can't sustain... In their market, despite the growth of households, they can't sustain subscriptions. The prices have gone up. The advertisers have long since figured out that they could reach customers at lower cost through other media, uh, social media, and so forth. We have in the Valley about 60 to 70 percent use social media. They mostly Facebook, uh, uh, mostly Facebook. We don't use Instagram or Twitter as much here, but we use a lot of Facebook. And that's not much different than what you find in an urban community. If you go into a typical store here, you'll find a person carrying a smartphone with access to uh, a local, uh, you know, a Facebook account, and they'll, which they'll use. I have almost 2,000 followers on my Facebook page, okay? That's half the subscriptions of the Times News in the city of Twin Falls. They don't have much more than about 4,000 subscribers. I got half that, just one guy who has a Facebook page, Okay. And I'm not that unique. There are a lot of people in public life who have hundreds and, and in some cases, thousands of followers on Facebook uh, because people turn to those pages to look at a sense of what's going on in the valley. Uh, Will that be replaced? I think there'll always be a place for communication devices, whether those are printed formats or electronic formats or on-air formats or however they may be, that we will have that because that's part of the glue that holds us now. Is it likely to be a stretched glue? Yes, uh, and certainly has been with the decline of subscriptions. I'd say this about the print industry in America is typically about 20% of what it was 20 years ago in terms of revenue and staffing, okay? If you look across a whole industry, but the entire industry is a, is about a $60 billion industry across America, okay? Today, that was 25 years ago, Today, it's about a $15 billion a year industry, everything from Maine to Hawaii, including the New York Times, okay? This truck stop out here on the highway, uh, Pilot, that's a part of a gas company that does twice the annual revenue that the entire media companies do in the entire United States, $30 billion a year. We're going to wrap up there. We want to thank former state representative Stephen Hartkin for joining us this morning, as well as Steve Millington. Uh, we can pick this conversation up again, maybe in a few uh, months or so, you know. And uh, we've got to wrap things up. Uh, 940. 20 more minutes of Magic Valley this morning still ahead. It's 38.